If you Google, does milk cause cancer, you will find dozens of studies stating that dairy consumption does in fact lead to cancer. Googling, does milk cure cancer, will display an equal amount of studies stating it's a cure. And dairy is not the only food that scientists have found to both cause and cure cancer. Studies on wine, tomatoes, tea, eggs, corn, coffee, butter, and beef have all produced conflicting results. So how do we know which studies are true, as we don't have either the time or expertise to verify them? Although not perfect, science is the best tool that we have to arrive at truth, as it produces the fundamental facts on which opinions, beliefs, and world politics are based upon. However, there are many challenges to identifying credible research. Dry text, technical terminology, and frequent paywalls make scientific papers virtually inaccessible to the public, leaving us reliant on the media for translation. New study shows late night snacking could damage the part of your brain that creates and stores memories. A new study finds pizza is the most addictive food in America. A new study showing that drinking a glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour at the gym. What? Not to mention that a single study can cite 40 other studies, which in turn cite 40 others, sending the readers down a rabbit hole of citations. But the bigger challenge is the fact that science is always growing and evolving. What's proven today may be disproven tomorrow and vice versa. Studies are often revised and even retracted, but today most information is static and doesn't update automatically to reflect those changes. In 2011, the German anesthesiologist Joachim Bolt was discovered to have forged over 90 studies regarding anesthetic drugs, which put millions of patients at risk. But perhaps the most dangerous instance in recent history is Andrew Wakefield's 1998 study linking MMR vaccines to autism, published in The Lancet, one of the world's most reputable medical journals. His findings spurred a global anti-vaccination movement, which has led to outbreaks of previously controlled diseases like measles and mumps, causing thousands of deaths. Further investigation uncovered that Wakefield had manipulated the data and had various conflicts of interests, leading to a full retraction of his study in 2010 and a revocation of his medical license. So how can we get to the truth? Current efforts like RetractionWatch.com keep track of retracted papers, along with the most highly cited retractions, in a leaderboard of authors with the highest retraction count. Although a step in the right direction, visiting a site every time you want to verify a study or an author is burdensome and doesn't scale well. My proposal is based on one of Google's most underrated projects, Google Scholar. It's a free database of over 150 million peer-reviewed academic journals, books, conference papers, dissertations, and even court opinions and patents. I envision a Google Scholar browser extension that detects retracted or outdated documents, warns you if a study citation is no longer valid, alerts of authors with documented fraud, and notifies of privately funded studies in hopes of helping the reader determine credibility. Imagine you go on a website to read an article on how vaccination causes autism. As soon as you enter, the browser extension displays a warning with the number of problematic documents detected. You will also notice the document's name is highlighted in red, indicating that the document is not credible. Hovering over the highlight will display a pop-up that gives you more information. Clicking more details will open the info card. Each card consists of several sections. In this case, the first one warns you that the document has been retracted for data manipulation. The next one tells you the document type along with its title. Then it displays where it's been published. Then the document's authors, their title, their employer, and other co-authors. The institution under which the document was published and whether it's private or public. Now, this is important because private companies have private interests and any research done by a private company I think should be designated as such. For example, if Coca-Cola had a study, it's in their interest to pressure the scientists to report that Coca-Cola is good for you and you should drink it 24-7. When Vox analyzed 100 studies by the Mars Corporation, which is the leading manufacturer of chocolate, to no surprise it found that 98% of all studies painted chocolate in a positive light that it's this healthy food which we'll save for another time. Now clicking each link on the card will lead you to a corresponding page in Google Scholar. So with that being said, um, there's a few things that I think could be the next step for this project. 
The number one thing I think is that this is a browser extension. And as we know, browser extensions do not work on mobile operating systems, at least for now. So I think a solution there would be to either port this into a dedicated mobile browser or maybe even bake it into Google Chrome. The next area I think would be artificial intelligence. You could parse through the semantics of a document or millions of documents and find meaningful trends, relationships, and connections that otherwise would evade us. I think machine learning could essentially become the biggest peer reviewer in the world. Another interesting area to explore would be crowdsourcing. Taking verified accounts for scientists, authors, and journalists and have them contribute online in the form of commenting or maybe even voting. There's academic platforms like pubpeer.com, which is essentially a post-publication peer-reviewed site. It's actually led to the retractions of, of some pretty high-profile cases. And last but not least, no project would be complete in 2018 if we did not incorporate the blockchain. All jokes aside, I think there's some interesting possibilities there. I'm imagining a medical journal or a scientific journal that is essentially a Ethereum app and all the quality contributions by authors could be rewarded with a crypto token. So essentially you're getting paid in crypto for contributing and maybe this would be a crowdfunding model for scientific research down the line. I think the very next step after that would be to completely decentralize Google Scholar so it's not owned by Google, but it's running on Ethereum, completely decentralized. Anyways, let me know what you think down below in the comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.